oh, this is exciting. So air hugs, air hugs, right, to everybody. Um, I have found out over the course of this pandemic that I <clears throat> am actually um, a, a feeler and a hugger, but please don't tell anybody um, because I always thought I was way too masculine for that. But, uh, man, I sure miss, I miss getting to, to just touch you. But, uh, but that's okay. That'll come again soon enough. Man, I'm excited you're here. I, I'm kind of out of, I have a whole idea of the words I was going to say, and then I see you, and it's, it's all changed. Um, why don't I ask you if you, um, nope, I'm just going to reset and start over. Welcome. <laughs> I know that probably there are a few folks joining us online, and we want to say welcome to you tonight as well. Um, if you're in the room and this is maybe the first time that you've had a chance to join us here at Waterloo, we want to again say welcome. There is a connecting card in the pew in front of you, and if you wouldn't mind just filling out a little information there, that would allow us to know that you were here and get to know you a little bit. Um, but then also it would allow you to reach out to us and ask any questions you might have about our ministries um, or um, ask us to pray along with you. And members also, man, if you have prayer requests, write them on those, and you can uh, leave those cards in the uh, black box that's on your way out of the door later on this evening. Uh, if you're online, you can do the same thing just by sending an email to us at info at waterlooroad.org. And either way, we would be incredibly honored um, to, uh, to pray with you and to connect with you tonight. So today is the first Sunday of the season that we call Lent. Uh, it's a time about six weeks or so. There's going to be six Sundays where we as believers, as a, a body of Christians, prepare our hearts for the coming of the Savior, for his resurrection uh, on Easter Sunday. Now, you know, traditionally you've probably heard or even said, hey, you know, I'm giving up Coke for Lent. Or if you're a really hardcore person, you're giving up chocolate um, for Lent. But that's not, that's not what it's about. What it's about is preparing our hearts and becoming more godly, allowing Christ to work in us and work through us in this time to make us more like him. So we're going to be focusing on that in our scriptures with these candles, just kind of as a visual reminder um, of the crucifixion and glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus. So let me pray with us, and then we want to share with you, you may not have gotten to see a couple Sundays ago, we uh, were able to celebrate a baptism, and we thought that would be a really fantastic way to celebrate as we celebrate being together tonight. So let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We praise you that you are the God of Lent, the God of Easter, and the God of every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth, for living a perfect life, and for dying on the cross as a penalty for our sins. And we bless you, Holy Spirit, for rising, raising Christ up from the dead, that we serve a risen Savior. We love you, Lord Jesus, and pray that you're honored by our worship tonight. In your name, amen. Sin is anything we don't do or do, anything we think, say, do, or don't do that disobeys God. Jesus was the only one who could die on the cross for our sin. So that way I can have eternity with him. They can have the same relationship. A turtle doesn't get on the top of a fence post by itself. It has to help have help. Cora doesn't come to this place, the waters of baptism, without the help of so many. And uh, I am so thankful for her parents, Christopher and Katie, that have taught her the ways of the Lord and have brought her to a Bible-believing church so that she can hear the Word of God, be exposed to the Gospel, and allow the Spirit of God to work. I'm thankful for grandparents that have prayed for her and set an example for her, for aunts and uncles, uh, and great aunts and uncles that's all had a part in praying for this day. And I want to ask if you are a part of Cora's family, would you just stand for a moment and uh, 
we want to recognize you and say thank you for being a part of this special day. God bless you for all that you have done to bring core to this place. I'll never forget the Sunday afternoon sitting at lunch table with my wife. Uh, we had just gotten through preaching and, and uh, was at home, and I got a phone call, and it was Cora's voice. She said, Grampy, I just gave my heart to Jesus today. And uh, my heart rejoiced. I'm not a gymnast, but I was doing cartwheels inside. <laughs> and uh, so it is my privilege and honor to not only get to baptize my granddaughter, but now she's my sister in Christ. And Cora, did you give your heart to Jesus on September the 20th of 2020? Yes. You did? You want to follow him the rest of your life? Yes. Well, Cora, because you've done that, it is my joy to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, the beautiful likeness of his death, but raised to walk in a new life. I love you, Cora. Love you. Amen. What a fantastic way to celebrate. I invite you to stand with me if you're able, and let's sing a song that reminds us of this story of the gospel. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds. His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid Him down in Joseph's tomb. Transcealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name for. The Son of Heaven rose again, O oh, trample death, where is your sting? All of the angels roar for Christ the King, and they sing, O oh, praise the shall return with robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Oh, then sings my 
Our Savior. We remember that he is our prophet, priest, and king. He has all authority over heaven and all the earth, and he reigns as our risen Lord. It is because of Christ's sacrifice that we are able to come before God, and we look to him to save us and to save our world. Hear these words from Hebrews 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord Jesus, as we walk with you through these 40 days, let your light shine into our hearts. Brighten the darkness of our lives and show us where we need to repent. In our thoughts, words, and actions, teach us to rely on you. Renew us, your people, that we may carry your light to the world. What are you reading? My Bible. Ah, the good book. (laughs) Yes, it is. And you are? Oh, I'm Fred from the sales department. Oh, that's right. Salesman of the month. Congratulations. (laughs) Oh, thanks. And and you are Sarah from Accounts Payable, right? That's right. Uh, May I join you? Of course. Oh, I love sales. The Lord has blessed me with many things. The gift of conversation is one of those. (laughs) The gift of gab is what my mom used to call it. I wish I had some more of that. You know, sometimes I just don't know what to say to people. I was in here at lunch when you were talking to Melanie. (laughs) You mean tripping all over my words? She was so upset. I should have witnessed to her shared Jesus with her, you know, how he died for our sins and, and he wants to be her hope, her helper, her friend. Uh, Sarah, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? Well, in heaven. Well, how do you know? Well, I have asked Jesus to be my savior, my Lord. I I try my best to follow him every day, and and I so want to witness, but my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. I'm a Christian too, and although I love to talk, I have to admit I'm sometimes not as bold to witness for Christ as I should be. 
when I was standing at the coffee pot listening to you and Melanie, I didn't know for sure if I should step in and help or just run away. <laughs> it all happened so quickly. It did happen quickly, didn't it? And I was not ready. You know, maybe we could encourage each other. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, well, what time is Melanie coming? Yeah, she should have been here already. I think she stood me up. What if I'd never get another chance to talk to her? Oh, I believe you will. I believe that God started your conversation with her, and he will make sure that you have a chance to continue it. Well, she did agree to go to church with me on Sunday. Well, you should stop by her office and make the arrangements. It will help yeah. develop your relationship, and, and you know, you might bring her a Bible, too. Oh, and I know just the friends to introduce her to. Thanks, that's a great idea. I'll do that now. Oh, well, let me know how it goes. I will be praying for her and for you. Thanks. Father, thank you for bringing people into our lives to grow us and make us more like you. Give Sarah the words to witness to Melanie. And Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will move in Melanie's heart so that she will be ready to receive the message. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We praise the God who begins a good work in us and is faithful to carry it on to completion. We praise the God who allows us to begin these gospel conversations and make sure that we have an opportunity to complete them and to continue them. I invite you to stand with me again. Let's celebrate the deep, deep love of God our Father for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold a man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Now I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Oh, Lord Jesus, your wounds have paid our ransom, and we praise you, we bless you for that. God, I know that you have given us a gift by calling us to be your children. You've given us another gift by allowing us to be a part of this 
a part of your family here at Waterloo Road. And God, as we've just discovered, you've also given us a gift by putting people in our lives that allow us to grow and allow us to share you with them. God, I know that we all know someone who is far from you, and we want to take a moment to lift them up to you by name, that you would begin to work and move in their hearts and draw them to salvation, Lord. God, we also want to lift one another up. You've said that um, as iron sharpens iron, so one person lifts up the countenance of his friend. And God, I pray that we would be able to be encouragers to one another, just as we've seen here. God, I pray that, um, that you would make us aware of the people around us right now and allow us to lift them up, asking you for strength and asking you um, for your Holy Spirit to do a good work in our lives and through our lives. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray that you would do your good work in us tonight as we continue to worship you, that you would do your good work in us tonight as your word is preached, as we lift our prayers and our voices to you. God, I pray that you would knit our hearts together anew. Thank you so much for this church family, Lord. And I pray that you would make us more like you tonight. Show us who you are. Show us your ways and help us to walk in them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I wanted us to learn this song. It may be new, and it may be not new because it's not a brand new song. So hopefully this is one you've heard before. It's called Show Me Your Ways. This is our prayer tonight. It sounds like this. If you want to join in, go right ahead. Otherwise, let me sing it once. Show me your ways that I may walk with you. Show me your ways. I put my hope in you. The cry of my heart is to love you more to live with the touch of your hand stronger each day god show me your ways that's all there is to it let's do it again show me your ways that i may Show me your ways, God, I put my hope in you. Oh, the cry of my heart is to love you more, to live in the touch of your hand stronger each day. Show me your ways. And the psalmist says this, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Good and upright is the Lord. 
Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And we sing, show me your ways that I may walk with you. Show of your hand stronger each day Lord show me your ways that's our prayer tonight church you can be seated good evening Waterloo Road how are we all right, if you have your Bibles, if you will turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and while you're turning there, just want to say it has been so good to be able to meet um, some of you for the very first time um, tonight, and then, and then others to be reacquainted. Um, around the time that I, that I came in, was, it seemed like when the, the numbers started increasing, but um, so many have said, you know, been, been getting to know you online, and aren't you glad, aren't you thankful um, for technology for such a time as this, and, and we're, we're always trying to improve on that. But, but there's something different about being able to gather um, face-to-face, even if it's just with half a face, right? There's something different about what we're doing tonight as opposed to maybe what we've been doing um, the last several weeks or months as we've just been um, watching online. And so just wanted you to know that I'm thankful for you, so glad that you're here. Um, and also, it's probably appropriate for us um, as a staff maybe to say that we're sorry that we're just now getting to this point um, for a service, particularly for, for you and, and many vulnerable um, with, this, with this mask only. But, but we are glad. We are glad that we're here tonight and to be able to open the Word. So Colossians chapter 2, um, whenever, whenever I um, was still in youth ministry, we decided, my youth, my um, worship pastor and I decided that we were going to take our youth choir, I served at a church that had a, a really large youth choir, 55 teenage students in this youth choir, and, and so I served in, um, in, in that setting, we decided we were going to take our students on a mission trip to New York City. Every year at the end of the year, we would take um, a, a youth choir mission trip, a, a choir tour, where we would go here or there, and we would sing along the way and do different, um, do different mission projects along the way and have some fun, have some fun along the way. And so we announced that we were going to New York City, and, and our, our students were pretty pumped. I mean, they were excited about getting to go to New York City. Most of them and most of the adults that were going with us had never been. Um, but I, I remember sort of this, this night of panic sitting in thinking, are we really going to take 55 students to New York City? Like, how, how are we going to navigate? We, we rode a tour bus, you know, like one of those 55-passenger um, buses, like Greyhound-type buses. We rode that to New York City. They dropped us off, and we were going to spend the week navigating around subways and on foot and, and, and um, no, no transportation other than that while we were in New York City. And so um, rather than trying to just sort of figure things out on the fly, my worship pastor and I, we flew to New York City a few months ahead of time, and, and we started meeting with the people we were going to be serving. Um, we started putting some eyes on the places we would go, um, making all the contacts, here's where we're going to eat on the way, um, all, all of that. And the last day before we were to fly back to Oklahoma, we decided, hey, this isn't probably good enough. Um, we don't, we're not comfortable enough. And so what we decided that last day we were in New York City on this preview trip, before we took our students there, we decided we were going to ride every subway route 
that we would take the entire week and, and we, would, we would get on the subway where we were staying, where we were going to stay. We would ride to whatever we were going to do on Monday. We would get off, walk to that location, noting all the restaurants along the way, any trouble points along the way. Then we would get on the subway, ride to where we were going next on, on, that, on that Monday. And we did, we, did, we did a whole week's worth of subway rides and walking to the destinations starting early in the morning um, and going into, depending on how, how you view the, the night, late in tonight or early the next, the next morning. And they're, they're all the crazy things that you can imagine seeing in New York on a subway at 1 o'clock in the morning, they're all true, okay? That we, we saw every, every bit of that. And so I remember getting back to the hotel room after, after riding every route and walking every distance that we would be um, going on when we brought our students back. I remember just laying there um, feeling exhausted, okay? And, and one thought in my mind was I've got to get a different pair of shoes if I'm going to bring 55 students and do this, do this all over again for a, for, for a full week. But, but that's the thing. That's sort of normal life in New York City. They pretty much walk Every, everywhere that they go, hop on a subway, get off at another spot, and then, and then they take off. They're hoofing it, okay? Which that doesn't translate very well in Oklahoma because don't we, don't we drive around for, for 10 minutes in Walmart waiting for somebody to back out like in the, next, in the first two or three rows, right? Just so we can save, listen, 15 seconds in our walk if we had, a, if we had a parked in the back and, and made our way up to the, to the front. Like, like walking doesn't translate super well for us, but... But it would have, it would have made sense for the church here in Colossae as Paul gives them some instructions on how to walk. So, so let me show you in verse 6. Verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, when they, again, when they heard walk, they, they heard normal life. Okay, when, when, they're, when, they're, when they're, they're wrapping their minds because they would walk to the supermarket to get their food or they would walk um, outside to whatever they're out, however the restaurant room situation was, that's where they would, they would hoof it, right? Uh, even to get water for their house, they would walk to wherever the well was, whether it be in the center of town or whether it be outside of town. They would walk, carry in their pitcher, fill that up, and then walk back home. If they were going to visit their grandkids or, or their grandparents that lived in another city, they would walk, they would walk the distance from one city to the next. And so what Paul is talking about here, when he says walk in Jesus, he's saying just like you eat, just like you sleep, just like you work, just like you walk, make sure it's centered in Christ. And it's interesting, the language that he uses here, he tells us, he tells us to walk in Jesus. Now, we, we tend to think of Jesus being in us, right? Because I asked Jesus into my heart. That's sort of the terminology that we use from, from the time kids are this big, is ask Jesus into your heart. So, so the idea of Jesus being in us, in us, might sound familiar. But Paul's going to flip it, and he's going to say, not, not Jesus in you, you in Jesus. He's going to say, walk in Jesus. And, and in this text, he's going to give us some very specific ways that we walk in in Jesus and so so this this evening four four ways that we walk in Jesus now if you've been watching the online stream you know that I ask a question right before we really get into get into things and so I'm I'm prepping you just so you'll know how you're going to respond so you know that that I expect an answer okay so four, four, four ways that we can walk in Jesus. So Waterloo Road, I'm going to ask you, are you with me? Okay, all right, number one, number one. Here's how we're to walk in, in, in Jesus. Number one, we are to walk rooted in Jesus. Walk rooted in Jesus. So verse six, just as you received Christ, therefore walk in him. Look, rooted and built up in him. So when I, when I made the transition from um, youth pastor to senior pastor, um, there, there was, and, I, and I was praying through all that and feeling that, that strong pull that God was moving me in that direction, um, my wife and I began to pray, and we began to, to sort of put, put our lives on the table and say, God, here, you can use this. Um, you could send us wherever. But we had a couple of 
exceptions. We were like, God, send us anywhere, but it'd be really okay if you didn't, if you didn't do this. And here was, here was our, our two requirements. My wife's requirement was that God not send us to Altus, Altus, Oklahoma. That's where she was born, western Oklahoma. Um, some people would might say it's the armpit of, of Oklahoma. And, and I kind of I got to kind of be careful because I had a guy come up to me after this morning. He was like, "Well, I'm from Altus," and and so it's just kind of an odd, a little bit of an odd situation. But I'm not I'm not really knocking Altus. It's other than the fact that my wife said, "I've been there, done that. Um, don't really want to go back." Okay, and, and here, here, was my, here was my requirement of the Lord, okay? Lord, I will, I'll go anywhere, do anything, be anything you want me to be. Just do not send me to a small town, okay? Now, now here, here's, here's my reasoning. I, I grew up in a small town, town of 500. Um, we had 30 in my graduating class, which was the largest class ever at Indiahoma High School. I, I feel like I had been there, done that in small town, um, small town church. And here's what, here's what I learned, even as a, as, a, as a child growing up. Here's what I would see. I would see. I would see people get mad at the pastor or get mad at somebody in the church, which, that, I mean, that happens, right? Like we are, um, when, we, when we rub lives together, we, we upset each other. And, make, and, and so if we're, if we're in a metro area and you get mad or don't, don't, don't agree with something, um, the, the, the leadership of the church, what you tend to do in the metro area is you go down the road to the next church where you can um, sort of get mad at that pastor for a while and then you'll come back or you'll go to that. that that's, just, that's just how, that's metro life, okay? In, in small town life, if you get mad or angry at the pastor, here's what you do. You cross your arms, you glare at the pastor while he's up there preaching, and you do everything you can to make sure he knows that you don't like him, that you don't agree with him, that you're not on board with where, where, where he's at, but you, but you don't leave. You, you might even talk about him. You might, I, I know it doesn't happen at Waterloo Road, but you might even gossip about him in a small town to whoever listened. And here's the mentality. I was here before you got here. I'll be here after you're gone. And so if he's there two years or five years or ten years, in a small town, you almost seek to make that pastor's life miserable if you don't like him or don't, or don't agree with him. He preaches too long, preaches too short, too funny, not funny enough. And, and so that was my, that was my God, don't, don't send me there because I grew up with that. I saw what it's like. If, I, if I'm going to give my life to advance the gospel, I want to give my life to advance the gospel and not argue um, with, with, with church members. And so lo and behold, if God did not send us to friendship Oklahoma, which is six miles outside of Altus, and population 17, and that included my family that had just, that just that moved there, okay? Garth Brooks sings the song, Wheat Fields, as far as I can see. You probably heard that line in one of his songs, and so he is, um, that, that's what friendship is like, and so Friendship Baptist Church is here, and there's, and there's wheat fields and cotton fields, and there's about five houses all right there, a volunteer fire department, that's it. That's it. We moved there in, a middle of, in the middle of a drought, which that's not really unusual if you know anything about western Oklahoma. They're in a drought 90% of the time. Um, but but whenever, whenever that drought goes on and goes on and go, goes on, I mean, the farmers, they start being like, hey, who moved here? What, what happened when this drought started? Oh, we got the pastor. The pastor moved here. Pro- probably, probably his fault. So, so, so we're, we're here in the middle of this drought. It's not raining. We're hearing the old timers talk about well, that we're, we're heading into the next dust bowl. Like, that's how dry it was. And so they, were, they would water the crops, pulling, pulling, ir, pulling water from the lake in their irrigation system. And so the crops would, would kind of would make it even during a drought, but that was it. And so your yard very quickly turned yellow and stayed that way. It was so dry, even the weeds were dying. The animals would die if there wasn't water brought in. I mean, it was... When I say dry, it was dry. The trees were dying. Every, everything was everything dying. We had two great big trees in the in the yard in the parsonage. We lived right across from the church. Two great great big trees. And all through that drought, the time we were there, their leaves always stayed green while everything else died. I, th- I thought about that one day. And then I thought about how deep those roots must go into the ground to reach that water that was way, 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 way below the surface. 
trees with deep roots make even the driest. They live and thrive even in the driest of situations when the roots are deep. If you've seen these storms that have blown over these massive trees, you, you see that the, that the root system is ginormous, right? And there's a, a hole in the ground um, where, this, where this tree has been uprooted because the roots run deep. That's the idea of what it means to be rooted in Jesus, that we're not, we're not superficial and we don't go an inch deep with him, but we have roots that over time they run deeper and deeper the longer we are with the Lord and the longer we desire to walk with him, walk in him. One thing I love about preaching through entire books of the Bible is you get to see things in context. And if you remember a couple weeks ago in Colossians, we talked about suffering. Remember, that's what Paul talked about. He talked about suffering. And last week, the the language that he used was he was struggling. And and, and here we get get to this point, right after the struggle, right after the suffering. And what Paul is trying to communicate to us is one of the greatest tools that God gives us in suffering and in struggling is roots that run deep. In Jesus. Friends, don't don't make the mistake that some people make. They they cruise through life and spend very little time um, connected to, to, to the Lord in scripture reading. They spend very little time praying to the Lord. They just sort of coast through life because they got everything figured out. And tragedy hits, and then 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 they try to go deep with the Lord because because things are tough. He hasn't designed it that way. He designed, he's designed it for us to go deep, to go deep, to go deep, to go deep. That when tragedy does hit, when drought hits, when dryness hits, we have gone so deep with him that we're still able to, to flourish as we walk connected to him. Being rooted in, in Jesus, developing these deep roots, that, that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen when we occasionally attend worship it doesn't happen when the only time we pick up our bible and knock the dust off of it is when we step into corporate worship deep roots rooted deep in jesus rooted in jesus it is a day in day out week in week out month in day after day month after month week after week back flip-flop week after week month after month year after year decade after decade walking in him rooted rooted to walk in jesus is to be rooted deeply in him the second thing this text is going to point out the second way that we walk in jesus not not only are we rooted in jesus but number two we are built up in jesus so verse six says just as you received christ jesus the lord so walk in him rooted and built up in him And so if the first example that Paul uses is sort of this agricultural example, roots that go deep, that's below the surface. That's things that you don't don't see. Now he's speaking a different language. He's speaking sort of this this builder, this construction language that's built up where where, where you can see what's going on and, and, and you are seeing fruit that's being produced as a result of being built up. And it's this idea of day after day, day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, time with the Lord, you're being built up layer after layer after layer after layer of being built up in Jesus. Now, if you went out this past week, you know a thing or two about layers, right? Because it was negative 30 with the windshield. I mean, what, what's that about, okay? negative 30 with the windshield and so um so i was out this week and i was doing some you know clearing off the the sidewalks and 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 trying to trying to get away where we could where we walk out and i mean truth be told i was going crazy um in in the house and so i had to get out and so so what i did is i put on like two or three socks and then i put on um like my under armor thermals and i put pants on on top of that and and i had like three shirts and a vest on and then a great big great big coat and then i i put my ski bibs on over over that and i had my my great big um, boots that are that are layered and, and insulated and so I, I'm, I'm out there working in the yard and, and believe it or not I mean you, you might have been out there in the same the same way but believe it or not um, there was a time when I was out there in that negative 30 
with the windshield where I got hot and started having to shed some of those layers. I, I never would have made it if I'd have just walked out there with my jacket, you know, just throw that on and go out there. Never, never would have made it. But there's something about layer upon layer upon layer upon layer that when you need it, when you need it, when you need Christ the most, he is there. When we've built our lives upon him and built our lives upon him, built our lives upon him. For the last, longer than a decade, about a decade and a half, I, I personally can count on one hand the number of days I haven't met with my Lord. And I'm talking about the number of days I haven't just gotten by myself and opened up the word and read the word and studied the word and prayed the word and wrote out in my journal what the word was saying, what it was saying to me, what it was, what it was saying, what it was meaning in the context, what it was saying to me today. So we're talking about 10, 12, 15 years of just a few days, a few days of missing out on, on that. And so here's, here's what I know. Here's what I know. That when I started, or, or even like this week, you know, if I, if I spend a little bit of time in the Word, um, I don't feel like that makes a real big difference if I'm just in the Word just, just briefly. But, but after doing that for a m- month, and after doing that for a year, And after doing that for a decade, I can look back and I can tell you with complete confidence that I'm not who I was a year ago, and I'm not who I was a decade ago. And and, and the, the biggest reason for that is that day in, day out, being in the Word builds us up, builds us up layer upon layer upon layer upon layer as we spend time with the Lord and as we grow in the Lord. Jesus uses an example of this in the New Testament, an illustration, where he says that there's two guys. One guy, the the wise man, builds his house upon the rock, right? And so there's a a solid foundation, and then he frames his house, and then he um, puts the walls on, and he puts the roof on, and the shingles, and then comes back with the guttering, and comes back with, um, you know, the, the... just the windows, all, all, all he, he builds his house starting with a foundation, then builds a layer, builds a layer, builds a layer on a solid foundation. He says there's also a foolish man who also builds on a foundation, but it's a foundation of sand. And so he frames his house on the sand, and he builds his walls on the sand, and he builds his roof on the sand, that being the foundation, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And then a storm hits, right? And which house does the storm hit? Huh? Both, right? Both. That's not a trick question. The storm hits both. It, it hits both, both houses. And, and there's, one, there, there's one that maybe loses some shingles, right? Maybe, maybe the guttering's damaged. Maybe a window's knocked out. But it stands because the foundation and the layers that's built on top of the good foundation are able to withhold, withhold that storm. And there's another one that's built on the, on the wrong foundation, layer upon layer upon layer, on the wrong foundation that when that storm hits, it falls to the ground. And what Jesus is going to compare that to, he's going to say, the one who builds on the solid foundation, the layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon, upon layer on the good foundation is the one who hears the word and then does the word. And the one who builds on the sand, layer upon layer upon layer on the bad foundation, is the 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 one that hears that same word and does not do what it says. Paul's going to say, if we are to walk, if we're going to walk in him, then, then everything, our lives have to be layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of being built up in Jesus That means my marriage needs to be built up in Jesus. That my parenting, my grandparenting needs to be built up in Jesus. My business, my work needs to be built up in Jesus. My hobbies need to be built up in Jesus. We find out how to do that in the Word. I hear parents and grandparents and friends 
they say something to the effect of, well, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how to center my, mar- my marriage, my parenting, my grand. I don't know how to do that on, on the word. Or they'll say, I can't have gospel conversations because I don't know the word enough. I don't know what the Bible says. Those who have said that they've been a Christian for a year or a decade or 50 years. I'll give you, listen, I'll give you three months to get there. To get there. And I feel like that's being generous, okay? Because God says that our lives, Paul says that our lives, if we are to walk in Jesus, we have to be built up in him. That means day in, day out, centering our lives around this, layer upon layer of hearing this, reading this, and then doing it. To be, to to walk in Jesus means that we are rooted in Jesus. It means that we are built up in Jesus. The third thing that Paul is going to mention here in this text is that we are to be established in the faith. Verse 6 talks about just as we receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Verse 7 Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Now, now we're in, I feel like we're in trouble right here because um, over the years, over the, over, the, over the years, we've almost been taught not to think when it comes to Christianity. And now, now here, here's, here's what I mean by that. Um, this, this doesn't seem to be a place where we're able to struggle with questions on, on um, you know, how, how this relates to, to what I'm struggling with, or, or um, you know, there, there's hard questions when we read things like, like God destroying the earth through a flood, and, and, and we, 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 we wrestle with the fact that how is he loving, how is he loving um, if, he, if he does things like this or allows things um, like this? How, how is he loving? How is he good if he allows a baby, a baby to die or a child to deal with, to go through cancer? And we, and we have these internal struggles. And when we get to church and we start to wrestle with those questions out loud, it's almost like we're taught, oh, no, no we, we, don't, we don't talk about those things here. Just have faith. Or, or, or um, whenever, whenever our, kids, our, our kids go off to college, um, for the very first time, they're, they're, hit, they're hit with things um, scientifically where, where this is trying to be disproved from a scientific standpoint. Okay, and, and, and our, our, our solution, what we've taught is, well, the Bible says it, it's, it's, it's true. And listen, we know that, we know that to be true, but when you're wrestling with doubt, there's got to be more. We've got to be taught to think. We've got to be taught to think, to think through issues, to think through difficulty. And so what we, what we tend to do is we tend to ride on the coattails of the faith of those who come before us, Right? We ride on the coattails of our parents, or we ride on the coattails of our of our grandparents, and and, and so um, so so um, it, it's got to be true because the preacher said it, or it's got to be true because grandma said it, or it's or it's got to be true because the Sunday school teacher said it, and, and and it's almost as if we lump we lump things of the Lord, stories in the Bible. It's almost as if we lump those things together with fairy tales like Cinderella, um, sort of putting that on the same, on the same length, all because we're taught not to think. And so we come up with weird, with weird things, and, and like, 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 how weird is this? How weird is this? And we have Christians, we have Christians who say they know the Lord and say that they are going to heaven that cannot point out in here where it says that God saves us. We have men and women who have claimed to be Christians for decades that can't point out in here where it says that we go to heaven which leads to some really weird twisting of Scripture. So much so that we believe things that are are biblical, like God helps those who help themselves, which is nowhere in Scripture. 
or God will never give me more than I can handle, which is nowhere in Scripture. Or my, my job to be, to be saved is to ask Jesus into my heart, where that language is not in Scripture, where, where salvation from a biblical standpoint always uses the language of repent, ter- turn from our sins, and believe embrace the belief that what Jesus did on the cross is enough to pay the penalty for. That's the language that Scripture uses concerning salvation. But because we've been taught not to think, we're never stretched when it comes to why we believe the things that we believe and our, and our kids go off to college and are butchered and they have nothing to stand by other than, well, that's what, that's what I've always been told. So that do some weird things. Like, Philippians 4.13 belongs on my ball cap. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, meaning that I can get this hit in this game. I can, I can score this touchdown in this game because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do we twist things out of context? And Paul's goal is that we be established in the, think, in the faith that we think through things, that we believe what we believe because we have been convicted having seen this in the word ourselves. Look what he says in verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught. Now, now listen, what, the, the way Paul teaches things sometimes is different than the way we teach things. And here, here's, here's how we teach things. Um, well, that's what I've always been told, so it must be right. Or that's, what I, that's just what I believe, so it must be right. Whenever Paul talks about just as you've been taught, you know what, you know what Paul does? He always goes back to Scripture um, whenever, he, whenever he talks about the things that he's always taught. Every letter in the New Testament, just about, is written to sort of correct some sort of... Um, false teaching that goes on in scripture and so so when Paul writes these letters to these churches it's because they've gotten off base somehow and so you know what he does he goes back to scripture as he teaches and establishes the churches in their faith back to the word back to the word for for why we believe what we believe not just because we've been taught I mentioned kids going off to college and getting butchered for their faith by professors and organizations and and classmates. Um, The statistic is that 80%, 80% of our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids will graduate high school, leave the church, many to to never return. 80%, 80% will leave the church never to return we've got a few kids here and we had a boatload a boatload this morning of kids of kids in the church 80 percent of our kids will go off to college walk away from the church and not come back all because they're not established in the faith steve parr wrote a book it's called why they why they stay, and so he looked at the twenty percent that stayed in church, and he said, "What do what do these guys have in common? What do these students have in common? What's the reason they stay in church?" And here's what they found out: the number one reason they found out that kids stay in church upon graduation. the the very The very number one thing is that the kids who graduated and stayed in church had a high view, a high view of Scripture. Because they grew up being taught from the pulpit that this is true and authoritative and sufficient for for us. And they were taught in Sunday school that this is true and sufficient and authoritative for for my life. They were taught at home that this is true and authoritative and sufficient for my my life. You you know what that means as parents and grandparents? That means that there's got to be lots of conversations with our kids where we say, you know what? Daddy's sorry. Dad's, daddy still needs Jesus. Daddy needs Jesus too. Daddy's going to repent. Daddy's going to realign his life underneath this word. And daddy's going to follow this 
this word. Otherwise, otherwise our kids grow up and they see us in our sins and then they see us go to church or they hear us say, do as I say, not as I do, and they grow up with a low view of Scripture. Not not because we're perfect parents or perfect grandparents, as if as if there's such a thing. Rather, they see us with a need for this, a need to realign underneath this. And that's how they become established in the faith. They see us become established in the faith. I read a stat from Walk Through the Bible this week. Walk Through the Bible, here's what they said. That just four days a week in personal Bible study, four days a week in the, in the Word, leads to a decrease in drinking to excess by 62%. Just four days a week in the Bible leads to a decrease in viewing pornography by 59%. Four days a week in the Bible leads to a decrease in sex outside of marriage by 59%. Four days a week in the Bible leads to a decrease in gambling by 45%. I'm convinced that whatever it is that we go to, whatever our addiction is, whatever we turn to when we're tired or anxious or down or depressed would lead to a decrease in that if we increased our time in the Word. Walk through the Bible, found out that just four days, just four days a week in Scripture led to an increase of giving by 416%. It led to an increase of memorizing Scripture by 407%. It led to an increase in discipling others by 231%. And just four days a week in the Bible led to, a, led to sharing the faith, an increase of sharing faith, an increase of gospel conversations by 228%. Paul, Paul says if we were to walk in him, we've got to be established in the faith. That what we say we believe, what we say we follow in here, that, that, that what we say we believe up here becomes a reality in how we live our lives when we're established in the faith. So to walk in Jesus, we're talking about being rooted in Jesus. We're talking about being built up in Jesus. We're talking about being established in the faith. And and then finally, number four, um, to walk in Jesus means that we abound in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. So we see that in verse six. As you receive Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And And it's the idea, it's the idea that as I'm being rooted in Jesus, as I'm being built up in Jesus, as I'm being established in the faith that what's going to overflow out of my life is thanksgiving as I walk in Jesus. Now, wouldn't you agree that that's been hard the last year to walk in thanksgiving? In, In the midst of a pandemic where we've lost loved ones, We've been sick. We've been worried about catching the virus. We've we've lost out on family time and lost out on holiday time. And there's been many who have lost their their jobs. And just one thing, one thing after another over the last year, it's hard, it's hard to abound in Thanksgiving when we're depressed and we're down and we're worried and we're anxious. But what Paul's trying to connect here is that when we're rooted in Jesus and we're built up in Jesus and we're established in the faith, that what that, what that leads to is this attitude of thanksgiving that, that, that means that, we, that there's this godly contentment in our lives with what we've been given and how we've been blessed and where we're at. That, that when we abound in thanksgiving, there's this, there's this ability to to not hold so tightly to our resources that God has blessed us with so that we can use our resources to be senders and to be generous and to advance the gospel. That To abound in thanksgiving means that we're not robbed. We're not robbed of joy when we see something on Fox News or CNN or local news or social media. That we're not robbed. We're not robbed of joy. Rather, we have thanksgiving even when the, we see everything around us seeming to fall apart. 
walking in Jesus. We got a little illustration up here. Um, talking about walking, imagine, imagine just walking down a, a path. What Paul's talking about here and what he talks about every week, what scripture talks about every week is everything starts with Jesus. And so the first step on the path is a real relationship with Jesus that involves salvation, right? That involves him calling us from darkness into life and us responding to him and giving our life to him, him saving us. Baptism is the first thing he tells his followers to do after giving their life to, to Christ. And so when when, when I talk about everything starts with Jesus, if you haven't given your life to him, these four things that we're talking about, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. But assuming you have given your life to Jesus, if we were to just lay this out on a visual, the first step on the path that we, talk, that we talked about is roots that run deep, that below the surface, that there's that real relationship, that growing relationship that time with Jesus, that established with Jesus. And, and then the second step along the path is being built up in Jesus. And so it's not just what's below the surface. It is your life-bearing fruit. And one, one example might be kindness. It might be kindness. There shouldn't be anyone more kind, anyone kinder than Christians who have been bought and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So being built up, we're talking about fruit being produced externally in our life. Maybe, maybe that's where you are. Maybe you've sort of got, maybe you've laid some deep roots and gotten past, and now your life's bearing fruit. Maybe we're talking, maybe, maybe you're sort of on the path. Maybe you're kind of to that place where you're talking about being established in the faith. Well, you say, Well, I am established in the faith. Listen, when's the last time you shared the gospel? When's the last time you had a gospel conversation? If you believe what this says, then you believe that everyone you know and love, spouse, kids, grandkids, neighbors, everyone you know and love will die and stand before Jesus and, and without Christ calling them and them responding to the gospel, they'll spend eternity in a literal place called hell. Do you believe, do you believe what this says enough to, know, to, to, to take time to, to have a gospel conversation with someone? Are you so established in the faith that, you're, that you do what the, what the word says? you're convicted there maybe you're past that and you're like to the point of, of needing to abound in thanksgiving but you haven't because you've been negative or you've been anxious or you've been um, a whole host of other things but thankful where are you on that path I'm going to ask us to do something super uncomfortable. In, in a second, we're going to have a time of response like we do, like we do every week. And during that time, we want to, we, and, and, during that time and, and after, and after, we want to give you a chance to give your life to the Lord. And when I, when I say after, you know, maybe, maybe you need to stick around. Maybe we need to have a conversation, um, socially distanced. Um, but but a, a, a talk about salvation if God's calling you there. But, but here's where it gets uncomfortable because I believe probably that most of us are believers. Here's where this gets uncomfortable. The response time is not just for people to come be saved. Did you, did you know that? I think the culture that we've created here at Waterloo Road, Rad, Waterloo Road Baptist Church is that the invitation time is for those to come get saved. But listen, it is for those to come get saved and for Christians to respond to what we just have seen in God's Word. We need to, at Waterloo Road Baptist Church, create a culture where we are always responding to what God says to do. And so here's, here's where it gets uncomfortable. During that song, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you don't stand and sing, maybe you sit and pray, or maybe you come to the altar and pray. You know, maybe you pray with your, with your spouse and, and, and you get real honest. And you say, you say this is where I am. I, I've given my life to the Lord, but I've never gotten past being shallow. In my faith, I never. I wouldn't say I'm rooted. I wouldn't say my roots run deep. Or maybe you say I'm at, I'm at number two, or I'm at number three, or I want to be at number four, but I just I, can't, I haven't gotten there. But you be honest and you be real. Where Where are you at in this? Are you walking in Him? Listen, not by your definition, but by what Paul says it looks like to walk in Jesus. And here's my hope. My hope. 
that wherever we're at on this path, that we'll take a step to the, to the next level. And here, here's, here's, what I, here's what I believe with all my heart, that us, even in this room, if we got serious about going to the next level, whatever, wherever we're at, just the next step for us, if all of us here got serious about that, Waterloo Road would never be the same. And Edmund and Guthrie would never, never be the same if we all got serious about going to that next level. Oh, the things that God can do if we walk in him. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. And God, we pray that you will help us to respond. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can stand or you can sit. You can come to the altar. You can pray where you're at. I I know what I'm going to be praying about right now because I've, I've been working through this all week and I know where I'm at on this path and I know where I need to get and so I know what I'm going to be over here praying you follow the Lord and you respond as he leads you let's lift him up together worthy of every song we could ever see you're worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other us the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. to those around me. Lord, this is our prayer, and we are yours. Amen. As it turns out, I'm the one that gets to finish this up here today. Well, again, church, man, what an amazing blessing to be together again tonight. Just want to leave you with a couple of reminders, and Heath helped me make sure I get them all. Um, but first of all, we have our preteen Go Weekend that's coming up this weekend. Um, and if so if you know of a preteen, whatever that is, like 11-ish, 12-ish, um, fourth, is that fourth and fifth and sixth grade? Thank you, Kurt. Fifth and sixth grader that needs to be there. Um, invite them, send them our way, and, and contact uh, Miss Emily here in the office, and you'll get all the information you need uh, for registration. And that's going to be an amazing time. And he, what is that? Read is. Oh, 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 make sure. Oh, wow, read. All right. 
I'm not even sure where I'm supposed to go with that other than the Lord reminds us, the Lord commands us to give tithes and offerings, and you can do that um, in the offering box uh, as you as you leave. Anything else? Read more. Okay. Wow. Well, it's just a good thing we're a family, um, and, uh, and we can give each other grace. Um, church, we love you. Uh, there are plenty more things uh, that I'm sure we need to tell you. Just check out your email, those five things that we want you to know. Um, those, things, uh, those things keep coming to us. The Lord is good. Amen? What is it? God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Let's go and serve the Lord and serve each other, remembering that God is good. We love you, church. Go have a great evening.